All right. So today, in our championing over violence, we had Dr. Jean Lude Cadet, who came in from the National Institutes of Health and talked about epigenetics and trauma and how that is transmitted through our body. He also talked about the use of legal and illegal drugs, licit and illicit drugs, and how that can drive violent behavior. And then we had Dr. Spencer Murray. He came in, he wrote a book on the conspiracy of silence, religions and patriarchal roots of violence towards women. But today, more specifically, he talked to us about otherness, how being made to feel excluded can drive and um, manifest as trauma in our bodies. And so it could be a form of violence as well when we're excluded with our, uh, within different parts of community, whether it's school, work, or religious community, etc. And then we had an amazing women's panel of four women spanning um, two continents and the Caribbean. And we had a very lively discussion that is available right now. It should be um, uploaded already on Facebook. So on WISC Institute, our Facebook, you can go look at all three of those presentations together from our morning program. This afternoon, we have an indigenous panel. There are many individuals who were invited, um, some of whom, decided that they were not going to be able to be here. However, I felt it was important that we have a connection to my indigenous community. We had two individuals from my tribe, the Kalinago tribe, present with us yesterday, but because of work, they were not able to be here with us today. There was a social worker and a community leader that was here yesterday. So I was really hoping that they would be able to come back and be part of this, this panel. Um, nonetheless, we have with us today, Tom Plenty Chief. And typically we introduce ourselves within indigenous communities with a land acknowledgement. This is something that I would in encourage all of us to, um, to do. I am also going to highlight you Tom in a minute here. I just need to um, remove the others and I want to spotlight. Let's see here, where are you here? Oh, you'd have to start your video in order for me to spotlight you. That's what it's telling me. So Tom, I didn't know if you were prepared to be on video. Okay, awesome. All right, so I should be able to spotlight okay. you once you put your video. Yeah, there we go. Add spotlight. So <clears throat> now it's two of us that are connected here. So today we have with us Tom Plenty Chief. And I will go ahead and do my own land acknowledgement. I, my name is Laurel Lamkin, Mabrika Laurel Lamkin. I live on the stolen lands of the Seminole, Tequesta, and Taino people, currently known as Palm Beach, Florida. And I am originally mixed indigenous from the Caribbean. We were known as Amerindians. My tribe specifically was known as the Carib Indian tribe. My, the counterparts in the Caribbean were known as the Arawak Indians. So we were both together called Amerindians of the Caribbean. Those were the colonizers names for us. The original name for my tribe is Kalinago, K-A-L-I-N-G-O. And they, the counterpart is Taino, T-A-I-N-O. And that's how they're spelled. That, so we all reverted back to our original names after colonization essentially ended, okay? So that is my story and that is my intersection with the indigenous community. And it is on my mother's side of the family that I've inherited that ancestry. We have with us here today, Tom Plenty Sheaf, and he can introduce himself to us. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is uh, Tom Plenty Chief, uh, Deputy Dananhu Nishana. Um, 
means uh, I am plenty chief. Um, I am here in Newtown, North Dakota on the territory of the Mandan, Hidatsa, Rikara people, um, Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. Um, on my mother's side, I'm from here. On my father's side, I'm um, Blackfeet, um, Salish Kootenai. <clears throat> so um, come from a lot of different tribes, but I was uh, cultured and uh, born and raised in this area with my mother's people. <clears throat> so I mainly um, have learned about Arikara, Sopnish, and um, Hidadza, Mandan Hidadza values and a way of life. Okay. Also a married man with uh, 10 children, two adopted children, and um, five grandkids that are our own, and five grandkids that are through the adoptions. Oh, wow. I didn't realize you had such a big family, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> cool to know about you. And not only your children, you, you also have extended your family to lovingly include children that you adopted. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only just your biological children, that's, that's amazing. Um, I didn't know that part about you. Tom and I met on an app called Clubhouse. Some of you, of course, on Clubhouse, since you're on there listening in in the room, you know all about Clubhouse. Those of you who are on, on Facebook, Clubhouse is another social app that really came on to the scene during COVID. And so it was a way for people to connect um, live and it's an audio app only. So Tom and I met there in one of the indigenous rooms at some point. We invited several other people who were not able to be here. Um, I invited others yesterday who were a bit resistant to um, being part of something that included uh, other individuals that were, were not non-native. So one of the things that I remember Tom mentioning in, in a room that we were in together was how his cultural experience within his, his tribal um, culture affected how he viewed women. And that's what I felt like the intersection was with this, this summit, okay? So in overcoming violence, how has your cultural understanding of our relation to women within your culture, how did that help you to have respect for women and, and be considerate in your relationships with women in your life, Tom? Okay, so that's a pretty, um... That's a pretty broad question. <laughs> and there's, um, I would say there's, there would probably be a few aspects um, to the answer because it's a multifaceted question, even though it's presented as one straightforward question. Yeah. So feel free, um, feel free to narrow it down anytime okay. you want. Yes. So, so just to go through it, the first thing would be my upbringing. So the first one would be my grandma. Grandma, okay. And the second one would be family relationships. I got to write this down so I can keep up. Okay, okay. I might need to write it down too. Let me do, let me just, yeah. okay, all right. So the first would be my grandma. Family grandma. relationships. Grandma, grandpa, I guess. And then the third thing would be um, cultural, uh, specific cultural um, teachings. And then the third, the fourth one would be ceremonial teachings. Okay, <clears throat> so so to answer the question, the first part I would say um, would be um, when I was about two years old, um, my mother and my biological mom and dad had already divorced. <clears throat> by then and she had her plans you know what she wanted to do with her life so she took me to my actually it was my great grandparents so at the time I think my grandma was around in her late 60s 
or early 70s. He was born in 1910, so that about her early 70s. And then um, my great grandpa, he was about he was about 60, about 60, if I recall correctly. <clears throat> so so they took me at that age, and um, so they became my parents. So so as I was growing up, you know, I got a good um, a good exposure to our culture and then to our language. And then also, you know, you, you know, they always say like, you know, uh, kids, you know, you live, you love them so much, you know, real unconditional, but grandkids kind of just a little bit more. So I was on the receiving end of that. So that was pretty awesome. <laughs> so we were pretty close, you know, with my, um, my grandpa left when I was a little bit younger. So I was around 10 or so. So I spent, you know, a lot of time with my grandmother, uh, my great grandma. So, you know, going to school or doing whatever I was doing. You know, she was always a very uh, supportive lady, you know, in my life, you know, she was always uh, unconditional and just encouraging all the time, you know, real kind, all, you know, always kind to everybody. Um, and then she didn't talk about things too much, like cultural values or anything like that. It was just in her action and the way that she was. So I witnessed a lot of things, you know, people would come around and, uh, you know, they would want uh, maybe ask for some prayers. So she would just, you know, get things ready her own little way and you know she would pray for them <clears throat> or uh, or people would come over you know relatives would come around they would visit you know come they'd come over yeah come on in you know and then you know the first thing she'd have them sit down she would get them something to drink you know at the table so they didn't stay on the couch you know in the living room they, they'd come right to the kitchen table and the dining room table there and have them sit down get them something to drink and she would start cooking and then she would dish them all up set their plates in front of them and then let them eat and stuff and then after they ate then they would visit so that was kind of a staple um and then she always made it a point to um to leave the door open when we when we would leave even if we were going to be gone for a couple of days she'd leave it open and i asked her I said, grandma how can you do that she said, well somebody might come over they might be hungry they could just help themselves that's what she would say and sometimes it would happen Sometimes we would get home and, uh, you know, from a, going to Mina, you know, a trip or a, out of town for a day or so. And there would be um, some hamburger would be gone or, or something. Some of the bread would be kind of missing, you know, a little bit, but everything would be cleaned up. And, you know, you could tell that somebody ate because there would be certain, like, the, like a certain pan would be out or whatever, but it'd be washed up and put away, like in the dish rack. So a few times, you know, we never did know who did that. We never did know who came over, but we just, you know, call it a blessing, I guess, which she, uh, how she thought of it, you know, so somehow it'll come back around, be a good blessing, you know, so, <clears throat> so that was, that was one thing to see how she was, you know, as a, as a lady, um, truest um, sense of the word, how she was and the supportive way that she was kind and uh, loving and all that stuff, you know, and, um, so that, that there, you know, that gave me a sense of, um, you know, when I get older and I'm going to find, you know, somebody, then that's the kind of person that I want to be with. That's the, and then I seen how my grandpa and grandma, how they respected each other, how they loved each other. You know, I seen how they, uh, how they talked to one another, you know, it was real gentle and it was like, they're kind of laughing, <laughs> laughing around all the time, you know, joking around and, you know, had a really uh, good relationship, you know, wherever we traveled, you know, sometimes we, you know, we traveled, you know, to Oklahoma, or Idaho, Montana, South Dakota, Washington, you know, just where Nebraska, we kind of went west and south for a lot of our trips. And, um, you know, just the way they were, you know, driving down the road, just visiting, you know, talking about, you know, times, historic times for them. You know, 1940s, 1930s, you know, back then, you know, before a lot of things had um, happened to our people here. So I got to hear a lot of them stories and hear them talk about it and you know, stuff like that. So, so that really uh, kind of, it was a big in, impact, you know, on my life. So that would be the first part of um, trying, to, trying to be, uh, you know, respectful and, and like that, you know. And then the second part is um, within our, um, within 
our, our Mandan Hiradza people, they have a thing called a clanship system, and then they have a thing called family relationships. Then the, the Sophnish people, that's a Rikara, they have family relationships, and then they have bands. So within, the, within these bands, they're, you know, pretty much everybody is related within the band. And then there's different family relationships. So like on the Rikara way, like your, your mom's sister is your mother. Her kids are your, are your sisters and brothers. And then um, <clears throat> her brother is your uncle. And then, uh, then on your dad's side, um, the dad's brother is your, um, is your dad. It's pretty much the same as a Hiradzawe, Mandan Hiradzawe. And then, uh, <clears throat> so, so these relationships, they, they give us like little, uh, like you don't talk to your sister a certain way. As a, mm. as a male, there's a certain way that you address them and there's a, and there's boundaries within the culture, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So one thing, like, for example, is you, that you, like your sisters, if they want something, you give it to them. If they ask you for something, brother, help me. I need this. I need that. Whatever it is. Then, okay. Yeah. We'll do it right now. Take care of it. Don't ask no questions because that's a female. So you don't want to be asking them questions. You just kind of do what they say. And then, um, so they, uh, <clears throat> they have that kind of relationships. They have boundaries. Um, like you don't tease your sisters. You keep your hands off of them at all. Like, you know, there's a, there's a real strong boundary there with, with female relatives. So you don't tease them. You don't be saying nothing to them. You know, you kind of keep your hands off them. They'll be like playing with them, trying to tickle them. Nothing like that. That's a boundary that we have within our culture. Even as far as like going in their room, like a brother will stop at the door. And he and, and the male is not allowed in his sister's room and vice versa. They're not allowed in their room. They, they, they have to keep their own space. And then, then the other, um, going to their aunties and uncles, like I said, it's about the same. So your mom's sister is considered your mother. Your mom's brother is considered, in the Hirad's away, your mom's brother is considered your brother. So that kind of changes things, how, how, how it goes generation to generation. Your father's brother is considered your brother, and your father's sister is called your shawi. And that's a term of respect. And then, so with the family relationships, we also have a clanship system. So you have clan brothers, you have clan sisters, you have a clan a shawi, clan aunt, you have clan fathers. And then on your mother's side, you're the same as them. So you're the same as your, so all the, like, for example, prairie chicken clan, which is mine, those ladies in there, they're all my mom's. Because I'm, a, I'm a son of a, a female so all those ladies in that clan are all my mothers you know, like my uncles. so then that through that through our clanship system we're never alone mm -hmm. because we have somebody on our father's side and we have somebody on our on our, on our mother's side we're never alone we have we have grandparents and we also have grandchildren the moment we're born so we're surrounded by people that's a family the moment we're born so we always have someone to go to we always have someone that's going to help us and take care of us and encourage us so if we if we need to have you know we need to have uh like say we want some advice or we want some prayers or or something's going on you know something's bothering us you know making us feel bad or something then we can go to our clan fathers or clan aunts kind of depending on the situation so you have a male and a female there to give you advice right away then if you maybe you you know you need some kind of support so what, what, who are you going to go your main support is your mom well if she's not there there's all kinds of clan moms that are there so you can go and talk to them and ask them tell them what you want to do okay son yeah i'm going to help you yeah and then also with um, grandpas and grandmas so we have a different relationship like a grandpa and his grandson a grandson and a grandpa they're kind of like buddies their best little buddies, you know, like grandpa, you know, like go around, take his grand grandsons around, kind of show them all this and that, you know. And then, um, but a grandfather and a granddaughter, they call them. They, they'll say that's my that's my girlfriend. That grandpa will say that about his granddaughter. Hey, that's my girlfriend. And then that that granddaughter will say that with her grandpa. That's my boyfriend, or that's my husband. That's what they'll say. 
So, so, and it's the same with a grandmother and a granddaughter that those two are always buddies. They kind of go around together, you know, they sew, you know, do some work in the garden, you know, cut, make dry meat or just whatever they're doing, go shopping, you know, stuff like that. And then a grandma and her grandson, the grandma will say, that's my husband. And then the grandson will say that about his grandma too. They say, well, that's my wife. Or that's my, that's my girlfriend. You know, they'll go around like that. And, and then, you know, She'll buy him stuff and like that, you know, and whatever. And, uh, it's a really nice relationship, but what that does is it teaches a person how not, you know, nothing weird about it, but it teaches a person that, like, you know, you could say, well, my wife, she always treated me in a certain manner. And they're talking about their grandma. Like for me, I'm talking about my grandma. But I'm talking about my grandma Agnes my wife, my girlfriend, she always treated me in a certain manner. So when they go out into the world and they decide they want to find someone to be with, they're going to look for someone who treats them like that. They're going to look for someone who encourages them along those lines, someone who's loving along those lines. So that's the, that's like with the family relationship. So that, so it creates, like I said, with our clanship and family relationships, it creates boundaries, but it also, it also opens up a person's mind to have uh, love and respect, you know, understanding. So, so it, it creates a foundation for that person in their life. And then they say, okay, well, my, my wife, she didn't talk to me like that. So, so I want to ask you, don't talk to me like that. You know, if a woman's treating her her man or the vice versa, my husband he he said no man can talk to me like that. So so you can't do that because then it creates a healthy foundation and and then a healthy boundary. So when they go about living their life, they'll carry those teachings on. Wow! So that's within our that's within our clanship system. And then the the fourth part and culturally specific, you know. Um, <clears throat> with our tribes and like other tribes you know they kind of have their own systems they have their own ways you know Lakota people Ashinabes, you know all of them they all have their own ways and then um their own relationships and stuff so you know I'm not you know trying to speak for anyone else but just besides my own family teachings you know even within our tribe you know there's there's different approaches to things but this is how I was taught so that's what I'm sharing um and then the uh ceremonial teachings so so I participate in um, this uh, deal that's called Native American Church. You can look it up, Native American Church. I also participate in this other ceremony. It's called a Sundance. And um, there's a lot of ceremonies that go along with that too. But basically, um, for the Sundance part, um, so the pipe, there's a, there's a thing they call it like a, like, I guess, settlers, they call it a peace pipe. But to us, it's a sacred pipe. It's an it's a instrument they use to pray with. And uh, they load tobacco in there. And then tobacco was believed to be an offering that was given to us to pray. You know, it wasn't supposed to really be used for anything else. So we uh, <clears throat> we use that pipe. And then through the pipe, a Sundance, the ceremony is a Sundance ceremony. And that's a, um, a, re a renewal ceremony. So that's why it's held annually. Like, to, so everything will renew. Um, there'll be, you know, good for gardening and like their hunting, all that stuff. That's all a part of it. There's all there's a ancient times there was a part of it for war too. So but we never learned about any of that part. Just the renewal part and the, <clears throat> the um, hunting, have a successful hunt and you know, all of that. So they um so what they say is that pipe, you know, with the um Arikara people that was brought by this lady. Her name was Mother Corn. And then like the Lakota people, they had this lady. Her name was uh, White Buffalo Calf Woman. And the um, Andan and Hiraza people, they have their own story about it, you know, where they where it, it actually came from uh, two brothers on their on their part of it. But there was a mother uh, lady. Be, uh, there's a woman inside that story. So all parts, you know, all of them, they have this lady. And then there's, they always have that lady. She always has a part inside the ceremony. And they say that, you know, that lady, she represents, you know, the mothers and like that, you know, sisters, you know, all the females. So you have to respect her. They tell us that straight out. You have to respect her. So, so that's like the culturally specific part. 
And then also with um, Native American church, there's this um, story with like the lady who first, there was a lady that first found this um, medicine they call peyote. And she found it, she ate it, you know, she was out on the, someplace out in the desert and then she found it. And the spirits, they, told, they talked to her, told her to eat that medicine and then, and then they showed her the ceremony. So then she brought it back to the people, and showed them what to do. And then she, and what she wanted was to bring water in the morning, to, um, kind of to, because everyone's going to be in there all night, you know, it's hot and all that. So she wants to bring in some water. She wants to pray and then get, share that water with everybody. So when she brings that water in, you know, they say that water life, you know, you can't live without it, you know, nothing, no vegetation, no animal, no person, you know, nobody, they can't live without it. <clears throat> so then they, um, so then that lady, she wanted to, to, turn all this whole ceremony over to the men folk, except for that water part in the morning. So she brings in the water, she prays, she shares that water with everyone to nourish them, you know, give them new life again. And then she offers that water. You know, she pours some out, you know, offers it, you know, to the great spirit. And then uh, they say when she brings that in, that she represents all mothers and she represents all, uh, all sisters, all grandmas, you know, all daughters, granddaughters, you know, she, all the lady folk that's around us, you know, so, so when she brings in that water, we all sit up on our knees, like usually you're sitting down, you know, sit up on your knees and kind of be, uh, be respectful. Don't, um, don't interrupt her. Don't be making noise, you know, sit still when she comes in you know, they have kind of teachings like that. So then that way, and then they say that they tell us that's what she represents. So, you know, then they tell us to carry that, you know, those teachings, carry them on, you know, your everyday walk of life carry those teachings on and be that way. So when we go out that ceremony, then we, we, we try to carry that on too, you know, within, within the, um, our, our everyday life, you know, be respectful, you know, to lady folk, you know, talk good to them, try to be helpful. You know, you see them, you know, this last week, we seen some lady drop the, drop a hundred dollar bill uh, in Walmart. We were down in Riverton, you know, she didn't even know it. her kids didn't notice it. Nobody she was putting her stuff up and she on the thing on that uh, get checked get checked out so we just you know hey grab that give that to her my kids you know so otherwise she wouldn't even been able to pay for anything probably you know so you know just things like that you know just everyday life try to be uh respectful kind you know considerate lady folk and that's uh, like i said you know with our family relationships and our culture you know it's not um it's not, it's not um <clears throat> something where you where you're rough on them or you're talking mean or you know anything like that you know that's not what it's about it's about encouragement it's about life you know within our culture there's only you know life is short you know we're not even we're not even here on this um this earth very long you know so we got to make the best of it you know we've got to try to help one another and take care of each other and all that you know Lots of love and uh, kindness and uh, compassion so to answer your first question, I think that would probably be about it in a in a nutshell. Go on and on all day, but <laughs> oh, I'll just so, leave it at that. Listen, I'm just feeling such a. I just need to give you a deep bow of gratitude. Seriously, um, that was amazing. So you started with your excellent modeling by your grandma and grandpa. And you talked about how, you know, within the culture, it's also imperative that the family relationships demonstrate even more modeling of what is acceptable in demonstrating boundaries, stopping at the door, not going into your sister's room, not going into your brother's room. So they're actually seeing what boundaries look like as children. And then you talked about specific cultural teachings where within your community, you know, there are things that you're taught about how to respect women, how to, to listen when um, these individuals come in, if they're in the room, how you're to conduct yourself. And then you talked about the ceremonial teachings, the sacred pipe. You talked about the mother corn, the wife buffalo calf people i was just like i've got to yeah. look stuff up 
Yeah, there's, there's just so much richness in, in how your culture recognizes the modeling needs to happen. And the thing that made my mind just go, wow, because from a westernized point of view, they wouldn't understand the need for the young person to identify their grandma or their grandpa as, as the husband or the wife. But that's called imprinting. That's something that, that we learn about in, in psychology, that clearly indigenous people understood that if they indoctrinated this thinking, like, this is how I am to be treated by this person who serves this role later on in life. But if you show them or play with them with it, you start showing them in a play-like environment, this is what it, oh, wow. That just made my mind go brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I have one more thing too. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, Bring it. all right. So, so another, um, I guess it would be under the culturally specific um, part <clears throat> to the answer is, um, I think that had, that was something that had caught your attention on Clubhouse was that uh, I just want to let all you ladies know here and uh, gentlemen here uh, know that, you know, like in the Western Western um, philosophy or whatever, you know, they have uh, like Europe or wherever, you know, Great Britain, you know, they have kings. There's a guy called a king and, you know, he kind of owns everything, you know, and then uh, then you go a step down, you know, then they have like some uh, lords and like, I, and, but they're, but it's always the man that has ownership of everything, you know, all the animals, all the land, you know, if they got servants, you know, it's that man that's going to say everything. And then they even, sometimes they even own that woman too, that they're with, you know, so that's a, um, that's a, um, a Western culture, our culture, nobody owns the land. How can you own something that was here before you and it's going to be here after you? How can you own that stone? It's been here for millions of years. How can you own it? You can't own it. You can just keep it for a little while. That's it. Eventually, it's going to make its way. You, know, you can't. You can't own those trees. You know, you didn't. You didn't make them live. You know, you can't do that. And then, uh, so everything is kind of communal. You know, when there's a buffalo hunt, they'll go out. You know, they'll get they'll get buffalo, and maybe certain ones are hunters, so they'll take it and they'll you know amongst the uh, like single moms or you know older folks that can't hunt for themselves or whatever. They'll. Um, They'll divvy that out to them first and then to the elders. And then after that, you know, the hunters will take, you know, a little bit for themselves, you know, not to that. take care of their family too. And then the other thing I, I think what Laurel liked was that um, in our culture, that lodge belongs to the woman, whether it's an earth lodge or a teepee or however it is, that lodge belongs to the woman. Everything inside there belongs to her. Because uh, Generally, they, they make all that stuff. So, you know, like all the, the stuff, the clothing, they make the clothing, they make all the stuff that they cook with, you know, they'll make it by hand, whether it's pottery or, or if they use a, um, use a stomach to cook it, however it is, generally they'll take care of their own lodge. They'll go get some firewood, you know, every now and then to cook with and all that. And then um, with the man, what he owns is his medicine bundle, his pipe, um, his bow and arrow and his clothes and that's it so when when this uh you know if say, say they were to separate she'd just take his stuff and put it outside and that's it and that's her safe place and he can't go back in there until he tells until she says he can wow and, and and they all know it too so if a guy you know goes there and tries to like hey i want to come back in no don't come in here and then she can't then he can't so she, she can make her own safe, safe place if she don't want him in there. So that's another thing, too, in our culture. You know, the woman, she owns that lodge. She owns that home. You know, and um, so when, I, when I, was, I was married, you know, this, um, this is my second marriage. My first one, I was, I was with that lady for about, about 17 years. So when we separated and, you know, that turned into a divorce, um, when that happened, I... Uh, I just took um, stuff, just the same thing. <laughs> I didn't even have a rifle either at that time, but uh, 
I just took my prayer stuff. I, you know, I took a, a bag of clothes. And then, um, then I left and I told her, I said, well, you can keep this house. You can keep the vehicles. You can keep everything. That's all, you know, take care, take care of everything for us, for these uh, little ones here, these kids. Because I don't want them to be without. I can survive. I'm a man. I can I can take uh, care of things. Hi. I went to say hi, grandson. Eat. My hi. grandson, say hi. Hi, how are you? Oh, he's adorable. My grandson, Thomas the third. So uh, oh, okay. he's, he's my oldest grandson. Yeah. Uh, he was named after me. So uh so yeah, that's how it is. So they have that, you know, they have that um I wanted them to be all right. And then I moved on, you know, moved on. I made my own way working and you know, stuff like that. Did what I had to do so I could eat and all that, you know, so. So that's another part of our culture. You know, that lodge, it belongs to the lady. You know, it's not the other way around. Now today, Western culture, they think the man owns everything. That's not how it is. You know, because these women, they give, they, 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 carry the, they carry the tribe. They carry the, the way of life. It's not the men. We take care of the ceremonies, but the women, they carry them. And they're the ones who teach the language. They're the ones who teach the culture. They're the ones who teach the, um, the philosophy, it's not the men. So that's why they, they, they have an ownership. They own those things and men don't. Because they don't, I guess they say if a woman wanted to, she could tell someone, no, you're not. You're not going to be running ceremonies and you're going to put that away. They have to listen <laughs> because they make that decision because of if there's something they're not seeing something, you know, how it should be or however. Okay. I actually, so that's a big part of our culture too. So I just want to, before I forget, I want to share that too. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I just wanted to, you know, just like we do on clubhouse, welcome in Balavi. Thank you so much for coming in. Dr. Kapal came in. I, I think he was having difficulty connecting his audio, so he'll be back. Um, we are currently speaking with Tom Chief, <coughs> and he is here from um, the indigenous community and uh, helping us to see from his culturally relevant perspective, how they are able within their culture and within their traditions, within their ceremonies, within the, the cultural modeling of behavior, they're able to circumvent a lot of the violence that we see in, in the westernized, colonized, patriarchal society. And it was a very rich discussion. You may want to go back on Facebook Live where this video is going to be housed and take a look at the full discussion because I know you came in, I was just observing you had come in um, when we were already deep into the discussion. But he talked on four areas based on the question that I had asked. He recognized that all the, all the contributing facets of his, his life into the kind of respect that he has towards women came from four things. One, his grandma and grandpa, a relationship that manifested after his parents divorced and he went to live with them. The second was within his family relationships, the way boys were taught to treat their sisters and sisters were taught to treat their brothers there was a lot of boundary setting that was modeled by the parents, not asking permission, not touching your sister inappropriately. If they don't wanna be tickled, you're not to be tickling them. Um, you're not to be touching them inappropriately. You're not to be going into their room and vice versa. The girls were not allowed to go into their brother's room. They were to stand at the door, right? And, and seek whatever they were seeking from them, whether it was something or attention or whatever. They were to have that discussion from the door. And then the third thing was specific cultural teachings that they had. And the fourth thing were the ceremonial teachings. And he was very generous and dropped into that stuff. And I just, I'm so thrilled that you accepted, you came, you shared so generously. I know in sharing with external communi communities, it may feel like, um, Native 101 that we have to explain about our culture. Like when people ask me about my people, they ask about the things that we do that don't really make sense to Westernized society. 
Like we drink bush tea. That's something that, that came from my mother's family, okay? They taught us how to make bush tea, how to go to the herbs to heal certain things that might happen, whether it's a rash or whether or not you have nerves or anxiety. Um, the other thing that they would do is pick certain plants and they knew which plants to go pick. And then they would make these bush baths. That's what they call them, where you bathe in it. And it, you know, now we know through science that, all of that stuff absorbs through the largest organ in our body, but native people knew that. But before the science was even manifested, somehow they made the connection that if you bathe in it, the medicinal value of those plants came through our skin and you know affected the person mentally and physically. So when I speak about those things, they're like, oh, you, you know, I forget what they call it in America, um, Bohemian. You're so bohemian with all of this stuff. Um, but that's the stuff that I was taught growing up that I still value. And I really appreciate you coming and bringing, you know, what, what you were taught as well, Tom. Is there any, are there any questions from the audience? Are you, are you up for questions, Tom? Or are yeah, you yeah they, could, they could ask questions. That's fine. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for being generous. Sarah, I can't hear you. I see your hand, but I can't hear you yet. Yes, I have one question. Um, a lot of what we see of Native American culture, of indigenous culture, is bastardized. But one, one of the things is the spiritual aspect of it. How mm -hmm. important is that spiritual aspect in terms of how it is you deal with women, how it is you deal with, with how you engage with Western society in this present time? Because a lot has happened in the past. So how important is, is the spiritual, your spiritual practice to maintaining those relationships, those male-female relationships in a positive way? Okay. Um, so there's um in a um in you know, in everybody there's um they, they always say there's four parts to a person. There's your mind, and then your mind, when they say your mind, they're talking about like your intellect. And then there's your, like your body, you know, top of the head, you know, your health, all of that, your spirituality. And then there's your emotions, you know, and that's your feelings, you know, if you're sad or if you're happy or whatever. So if you don't take care of all of those and, and keep them in balance, you know, in your everyday walk of life, then you're going to have a hard time. So that spiritual aspect, that, that's a part of our everyday walk of life. You know, our people, what they teach us is to do is to get up in the morning, you know, before sunrise, you know, no matter what time of year, go outside, you know, face to the east, there's a star, they call it a morning star. And when that morning star is the last one there, before sunrise, there's kind of a certain, there's a certain feel to the land. There's like a certain blessing that's coming. And then that's, that's, that's when they tell us to pray the first prayer of the day. Then the next one of the day, the sun is about straight up straight up and it kind of kind of gets a certain point and it seems like it just stops then right there you pray again and then later on you know towards the day right about sunset right when the sun just barely goes down then there's another certain kind of a feeling to that time of day too and then you pray again and then after that you know probably going to be up for a little bit and then it's kind of uh dark you know and the stars are you know everything's dark then then you go to then you pray again so they tell us that, you know, four times a day, you know, whether you're a male or a female, that's how we should be praying. At least those, those times, say a little prayer during those times and then continue on. So within our, within our relationships, you know, as a male or a female, you know, looking into this Western, Western world, you know, we just have to adjust and we have to kind of make, kind of make, uh, make time, I guess. You know, sometimes just stop. Maybe it's just a little bit, you know, maybe it's just a, not even half a minute. Just say a little prayer real quick, you know, creator, you know, my heart and mine, you know, how I want things and all that, you know, and help, help, help my relatives, help my people. That's it. Help me, you know, help me to think good, help me to be healthy, help me to, to, to be safe, you know, things like that. Be around good people. And then, then they say, when you're praying, you got to do your part too. You know, if we leave it up to a creator, you know, maybe it'll take kind of a long time because creators are from beginning of time till now. So, you know, 
end of time. So creator has his own time, but maybe that was just a little while to creator, but to us, that's a long time. You know, 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, whatever, that's a long time to us, but the creator, maybe that's just a link of an eye. So we got to do our part too to make those prayers happen. You know, I always say, people say meet creator halfway. I always say meet creator all the way. But don't be halfway about anything, you know, especially when it comes to prayer, you know, so... Because, uh, because you know, creator is gonna wherever, wherever this this power is at. This this uh, consciousness of the, of the great spirit of the creator is at. You know, it could be just right here in front of me right now. It could be someplace, but but that creator, he can make some. Uh, this creator can make uh, can make things happen in this in this physical realm. Can make people get well. Can make you know people. Can see they can see again, can make them have no cancer, can make them, you know, diabetes go away, you know, things like that, can make people be safe, you know, can make people come out of homelessness, come to a safe place, you know, things like that, you know, however it is, you know, so, so, but we got to do our part too. You know, if we pray for some good health, well, we better take care of our health too. Take care, do some exercising, eat some good food, you know, something healthy, you know, stay away from McDonald's and, you know, things like that. You know, eat something natural, you know, something our body knows. You know, as indigenous people, we've only been around this this Western, you know, only a hundred, a little more than a hundred years now. About 120, really 140 years. That's not long enough time to get used to their food. You know, we're still used to um, berries and fish and uh, buffalo and, and garden food. Our bodies, you know. So, so, but that's kind of getting off the kind of getting sidetracked there but that's all kind of part of the same thing you know your holistic health you know and then then, then that spirituality that's you know even in our relationships you know that's a part of it you know when uh when i met my wife you know that i'm with here today you know it started with a prayer we actually met each other at a spiritual place and then then we got you know we got to talking and we left um Try not to get mixed up you know because we're both praying in the same place you know and we just kind of got to talking and just took our time you know and then we just decided to be together and like okay don't be together then so that's it you know so it's been about uh it's gonna be 10 years now this or nine years it's uh nine years i don't know yeah nine years 21 years been around and Pouring one another and stuff, you know, and this life has been just so, you know, when you have a, a companion that will support you and love you and help you and, and talk kindly to you and do all of these different things, you know, unconditional, you know, and then you work together, like, yeah, you could do wonders. You know, we've accomplished things together that I would never have thought that I would be doing. But because we have, we support each other and her, vice versa. She's, she's doing things like she's the director of a department here now, you know, and, uh, you know, it's to support and encouragement, you know, of each other, you know, so we could do great things, you know, together when you have that good support and that good, you know, relationship and that spiritual part is that's a big part of it. You know, pray together. You know, sometimes we'll pray here at home or, you know, go to like a sweat or a ceremony and pray together, keep those things going. So kind of in a nutshell, I guess. <laughs> answer your question okay is is that good sarah jane yes okay awesome okay one of the things that i did want to to disclose because people might be wondering every single speaker i have been introducing them really with pomp and fanfare around their bios okay and in having worked with individuals from indigenous communities throughout the world I know that modesty and humility are some of the huge tenets of the culture. And so I didn't do the whole pomp and circumstance and that was deliberate, okay, everyone. Just so you know, those who are viewing, you know how we've been doing each speaker, okay? However, Tom is very entrenched with his community. He does amazing work within his community. He is very much a leader 
and I have seen on Facebook, I'm so privileged to be connected to his Facebook. I'm there looking at these lodges that they build from these timbers where they go and do ceremony, where they go and educate their people. And they do all of this in community and just, just seeing it. And like, you, I am so appreciative of your, of your pictures because you, you make us, you let us see from the Genesis how all of this takes place and then to see these huge structures with the timbers and I wish I could make you PTR that picture so that they could see these huge I don't even know how y'all get these timbers to do that it's like how <laughs> with the pyramids of Egypt built that's the same way I think of these things it's like how did they get those huge lungs up there to do that I, I just I mind blown okay just amazing and then the teepees oh my goodness those huge teepees that are like three bedroom houses <laughs> i have never seen in my life like what amazing just amazing he, he i know he's like one of their finest indigenous engineers <laughs> he just builds these amazing amazing structures I don't even know how to explain it all to you. Maybe he'll he'll send you a picture. I have no idea. You can bang if you want in the chat. Um, so I, I wanna just let you know, he's just an amazing, amazing leader within his community. And he would never tell you this, but I'm letting you know that he does amazing work. Um, and he's deeply, deeply spiritual. He's very much involved in Native American um, church. And I actually want to know a lot more about what that looks like. You know, what, what exactly does the Native American church look like? You know, um, where do you meet? Do you meet in ceremonial structures? Do you meet in, in regular brick and mortar facilities? You know, I'm like, so intrigued with with everything that I'm learning about we call it our relations or our relatives indigenous people seem to be most comfortable with other indigenous people and that's just true mm -hmm. okay this, that's where I feel most at home um, when I got to know the Micronesian and the Hawaiian population because they are also island natives they resonate a lot with the way I was raised. Their culture resonates a lot with the way I was raised. And honestly, your grandma sounds a lot like my grandparents because they would leave the door open for people to come in and people would just come in from the neighborhood and just walk right into the house. You know, they never, even at night, they didn't lock the, the, the gate to the house. They always had it open. And so I, I understood that. You know, um, people who don't come from cultures like that, they, they think it's weird. They think it's unusual. They think it's unsafe. But I really like the way that my grandparents were, were also very much embedded in their community. Yeah. Anything else that you want to share with us, um, Tom? And I was going to ask you, I know that I had invited you back to come back at, um, at 315. Mm -hmm. Um, and Pallavi was going to share for about 15, 20 minutes, right? Yes. Okay. So it's up to you. I don't, I feel like, um, I want to just respect your time. You let me know. I know you're with family and you have a big family, what you would like to do. She, she's here, um, mm -hmm. her country and she's, she's actually logging in from quite a distance as well. So I wanted to make sure I gave her her 15, 20 minutes to speak. And okay. Then, did you want to come back and share more? You can um, go be with the family and come back, whatever well, you want to do. Um, let me see. Where's it? Like 15, 20 minutes. Give us like 15 Yeah, I could, I could probably come back and maybe we could just chat or visit for a little bit, you know, chat a little bit, just about, you know, more general stuff or however, you know. Yeah. That would be okay. That would be me. I'm going to take a little break, though. I, I want to hear um, Palavi, what you have to say, but I'm going to take a little break first, though. So. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, welcome in Palavi. And I am going to go ahead and spotlight you, okay? 
which means that you'll be coming up right alongside me. Hi, how are Hi. you? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I am well. I'm delighted to meet you finally. I am looking for your bio right now so that I can introduce you properly with all the pomp and fanfare. Oh, you're very but us, yes, for those of us, Joshua, you're in the room on the stage with me on Clubhouse and we also have individuals who have been coming in and out viewing live on Facebook. So I do wanna make you aware that you are transmitting live to an app called Clubhouse and also onto Facebook. We are also recording this on Zoom for future reference for those who weren't able to be here live with us today. So perhaps, um, what I should say is how you and I came into contact with one another. And that was essentially through one of the MVP connectors that we have here. And she is with us today, Miss Sarah Jane. <laughs> Miss Sarah Jane connected with someone else that connected me with you. And I said, ooh, her bio sounds amazing. Definitely would love to have her here with us, okay? So for everyone listening, Sarah, what did you Aisha say? Goes. Oh, Aisha. Goes. Aisha was the connection, okay. I'd be interested in how you connected with Aisha as well. That, that would be positive. Okay, so let me give you your pomp and, and, and fanfare, right? So. Ms. Pallavi Mahajan, is that is that how you say your name? Yes, I do, but it is not. It is Pallavi. Pallavi. That's Pallavi. right. Okay. So yeah. The stress is different. Pallavi yeah. Mahajan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is a gender rights lawyer and advisor with over nine years of professional experience in gender advocacy. So. She fights for us women and children, okay? So as a genderized lawyer and advisor, she's advised diverse people and on inclusion policies. So we also appreciate that she follows the rule of law and the policy frameworks within her that legal environment. She also addresses discrimination and harassment gender-centric strategic philanthropies. She's also worked with ministries, CSR. What is that, CSR? Corporate social responsibility. So corporate social responsibility wings on the private sector. Ah, okay. That's not some one that we're familiar with over here in the US. You know, if they were more responsible, we won't have some problems we have. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so she's also involved with think tanks, CSOs, grassroots organizations, traditional women's rights movements, she, and in generating knowledge products. What is that? So say tra training um, manuals or uh, resource, uh, resource uh, guidelines as to how sexual harassment at workplace happens or how inherent patriarchy happens in households or how we are able to provide infrastructure uh, capabilities to women, but are not providing them adaptive skills. So anything re uh, related to knowledge resources, which could be used by third party to devise their own interventions. Okay, excellent. Just, she, she's such a teacher. I love it. Thank you oh, so awesome. much. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep it going so we can get through her, her bio, which is, which is just quite amazing. Okay, so she, provides expertise, she builds partnerships, she facilitates dialogue as she's doing today between her community and our community here in the US and throughout the world. She's certainly facilitating dialogue today. And she addresses policymaking, project management, working across geography. So throughout the world in partnership with the key stakeholders involved. She's acquired high technical skills of gender mainstreaming. I would love for you to explain more about that and interpersonal attributes of co-design and participatory approach. I have worked, she's worked on elaborate and critical SDG five issues. Perhaps you could explain SDG five. So SDG five is a sustainable development goal number five out of the 17 SDGs of the United Nations. So SDG five focuses on gender equality. Gender equality, there it is again. CD, 
C E D A W. That w is the Convention for Elimination of All Kind of Violence Against Women. That is also an international mandate which was signed in uh, 1995 uh, by uh, the General Assembly, which happened in the UN. And after that, basically certain rights, which actually the black women started uh, fighting for the feminist rights in 1940 during the first wave of feminism and they asked for suffragette rights that escalated to CEDAW, which meant that any kind of violation or any kind of violence against women is a criminal offense. I love that you're here. I just want to say that. <laughs> Okay, I, I just love that you're here educating our audience because you're not just educating the ones in the room, which may seem like a little, but there are people who've been coming in and out of the room on Clubhouse all day as we're doing the summit streaming on Clubhouse. There are people who have been coming, chiming in and out on Facebook as well. And this is going to YouTube. This is going to TikTok. We're going to have this explode all over the place. And you just going to see this stuff just keep going. Okay. Wow. So we also know that you are involved in women's and girls' legal rights and transitional justice. We can talk about what that is later. Yeah. Techni technical cooperation and responsible government at the local and national level. God, can you come teach them something here in, in the US? Because we all need over the world. Okay. All over the world. <laughs> okay, we need to clone you. Okay. <laughs> all right. So through her various leadership roles, she's familiarized herself with socioeconomic occurrences and their gendered outcomes. She's going to talk about, about that when she addresses us. And as a UK youth board member at the OHCHR, Geneva, the Geneva Council. Exactly. The Office of the Human Rights Commission, Geneva, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Council for the Afghan Youth Ambassadors for Peace Organization in Afghanistan. Advisor for Girl Up. I'm getting goosebumps. Seriously. You just like championing the cause of women and girls everywhere. Okay. Advisor for Girl Up India and Policy Advisor for Lawyers Without Borders in the UK. She has learned to mitigate policy gaps to advance the gender lens, noting the growing importance of maintaining alliances and strategic partnerships in informing gender equality issues. I have, she's, she's diversified, I have to keep changing it. She has diversified her extensive network to 160 plus countries through is it called the Chevening? Yes, it is. Chevening Scholarship from the Royal Society of Arts. It's a fellowship that she got there and the CSW, which she explained before, and but number 21. And she's in that delegation working on that. And she's also in the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit. Now, at this point, most people would be like, feeling really small, like they haven't accomplished very much, or they may do the opposite. They'll be like, get sarcastic or cynical. I am none of those people. I'm going to say that I just adore you, okay? I adore what you are doing in the world. I have no idea how you have the energy for it all. I applaud it though. And I just wanna lift you up bring you flowers and chocolates and let you know that I just, I, I just, I'm in awe right now. So <laughs> tell us about what you want us to know. Tell us about the work that you do. Um, and I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. First of all, Laurel, uh, you've been very, very, very kind with your words. Uh, I'm just a drop in the wide ocean of the of the feminist movement and, and the feminist scholars that have been doing. I am just a trickle down effect of the feminist movement that have happened in the first and the second wave of feminism. And we are just living their dream. So while I can get a visibility, there are so many. There are so many due to various handicaps of socioeconomic backgrounds due to color due to ethnicity and I'm so glad I got to hear Tom somebody from who represents the is a representative of the indigenous community because we do not get to know their story and we somehow only get a white supremacist talking about the indigenous people which is not the correct way of positioning people only an indigenous person can do his talking 
Similarly, uh, I have I've had a huge support system. It takes a village. I am extremely fortunate to belong to a very progressive family. I have a younger sister and we are two sisters and our parents have been extremely supportive to help us venture into the fields that we have want to and rather um, Brother, parents who have always told us that it is so important for, for, for women specifically to have an individuality of their own and rather not get shunned away the patriarchal beliefs because uh, I'm sure most of the audience and you are aware India is comes from a very, very strong patriarchal system. I mean, I'm not denying the fact that the entire world is patriarchal, but uh, my parents have both have had such a huge impact and specifically my mother who when she was carrying my younger sibling was also reading her PhD. And she came from a very patriarchal setup and uh, earning her own money. And she was very, very uh, clear about how money is to be respected, how individuality is to be respected. So I think I take a lot from the people. And as you mentioned, from the community that I come from and throughout my living, I have been extremely fortunate to rub shoulders with, to have a tea to teeth with, with such fantastic women who have added so much value into my life. And has, as you mentioned that how I got to know Sarah, I got to know Sarah to Aisha and Aisha and I went to the same school. And Aisha is also one of such strong women that I have met at IDS. Women who are literally breaking the glass ceiling, not just for themselves, but also paving it easier for the future generations to come. Because what in the world as a whole, we forget that feminist movements are never about us. Feminist movements are for generations to come. I mean, in my time or even in a generation after me, we are not going to see gender equality. Let's be real, a 50-50 equality is not going to come. But we are under the belief system that at least a generation after us will have it easier than what we had. We will not have to debate on, abo ab on, ab on abortion rights. We will not have to debate on representation of women in politics. We will not have to debate on why sexist and racist jokes are not funny anymore. So that is why feminist movements or any kind of solidarity is required. And uh, as you mentioned about, uh, you know, me feeling intimidated or anybody else feeling intimidated, I think that is also a setup by patriarchy. You know, there's a concept in feminist literature called patriarchal dividend, which basically says that uh, this entire concept of how women cannot support each other and women are always fighting against each other is a fallacy. It has been created by the patriarchy because they have made us believe that you and I as women have to fight against each other and we are not pitting against men, which is, which is absolutely true, which is absolutely false. We are all at equal level finding a space under the sun and each one of us has the opportunity to have an equal space. Do not tell me that I just have two spaces as a woman to take on and that's why I need to pit against my own my own women uh, solidarity groups. I don't have to. That is that is my empowering model. So this patriarchal dividend was actually created by men. We are in solidarity with each other and that there is nothing more beautiful, powerful and empowering than women friendships. Because no matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what geography you come from, women always are on some spectrum of marginalization. Even the, white, even the white women coming from the global north, they are marginalized. And therefore we, we, we share that empathy. And that is why the support system in women feminist groups are so strong. So yeah, that's a little bit. And uh... you, you didn't hear me screaming because fortunately I was on mute, but I was like, oh my God, yes. Thank <laughs> louder for the ones in the back. Oh. <laughs> Yes, this is this is when I get excited. I get real, you know, animated. Oh yeah, we are all up for emotions. <laughs> you know, they're, they're how how men teach you that women are not supposed to put exclamation marks on their emails. Listen, we are going to put exclamation marks. You better understand it by now. You must be cold-hearted. Women are not. We are all full of emotions, and you better get ready for that. <laughs> so this is exclamation marks. <laughs> Oh, goodness. I love you so much. Um, I needed to clip that last statement right there and post that on Twitter. <laughs> clip the last 30 seconds of what you said, okay? Please continue. Fantastic. So today, taking forth from uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's entire discussion on how men and masculinities are to be included and how we are not supposed to alienate men from the entire gender equality movement. My 
my panel discussion today would be on inclusion of men and masculinities in the gender equality debate. And I would like to share my screen just a second. Is my screen visible? Yes. Fantastic. So today we are going to talk about uh, redefining hegemonic masculinity and I'm going to break it down easier because I do understand that uh, these are little academic words and nobody likes to be perched on academic tower because now we are talking basics and now we are talking on something that on daily discourse we need to discuss. So what is hegemonic masculinity? Hegemonic masculinity has nothing to do with all men are wrong. It has to do with the idea of certain type of masculinity, which is put on a pivotal of the gender debate. So uh, how a heteronormative norm, how heteronormative masculinity defined? It is defined as a, as a big man with big shoulders, a white man specifically, who takes control of the family, is a breadwinner, does not display his emotions. And this is a toxic understanding of masculinity. This is not just toxic towards the men as a gender, but also towards the other gender, because now they have to look up to a certain idea of masculinity and ape their own narratives around gender. Now let's understand what, how do we define uh, hegemonic masculinity? What are the operative words to define hegemonic masculinity? Now the first one is dominance, that hegemonic masculine men, which are on the top of the gender debate are dominant in relationships. Now dominant just not, does not only mean that they're dominant in a household, but also dominant in the workplace, also dominant in sexual interactions with the other genders, dominant also as to what decisions are to be made. And they're obviously also patriarchal. By here, I would like to first give a caveat that whenever we talk about feminist movement around the globe, there is a myth that feminist movements mean that we want to establish a matriarchy. Uh, a, 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 feminism has nothing to do on establishing one gender or the other. Feminism basically means, or a feminist basically means an opportunity of equality. So it doesn't mean that we want to establish a matriarchy mode of uh, society and norms, but rather opportunity and equal opportunity mode. It also means social power where decisions in the society, say in the governance model, or in, uh, in bureaucratic relationships are defined by how men see it. So like how uh, in Italy recently, about two days back, they, the entire house celebrated when abortion rights were uh, stripped off women or how, and, and how LGBTQIA community was declared illegal. There was a huge applaud from the house of the, the house, the parliamentarian house. So that is a clear example of hegemonic masculinity where men, or a certain idea of men think that this is how the other genders need to behave. Similarly, agency. Now, agency is a very important concept when we discuss about women or gender equality movement. Uh, for a very small example, what does agency mean? Agency means that you do not just give me the resources to earn money, but you also give me the power to decide where is that money spent. So if I earn money and I bring it to home, my partner who is a heteronormative heterosexual man does not decide how that money is to be spent. I decide how that money is spent. And then it comes to globalization. Now what happens in uh, societal norms as we have seen to a lot of policies and research and interventions is that the global South is always imitating the global North. And in the global North, if there is certain uh, kind of a discourse over certain men who are elite, more intelligent, wiser than the other races, that is the kind of notion that we start developing. And in most of the developed white world, hegemonic masculinity, big men, strong men, tall men, men who do not display emotions, men who are, who are dominant in, in relationships are idolized. Going to the next slide. Now, hegemonic masculinity, if we start to define it, it does not only uh, is embedded in the social institutions, it is embedded in the, in, not only in, in the social discourses, but also in the social institution and structures say state, education and family. How many women do we have who are parliamentarians? How many families do we have where women is the male bread earner and a man is a primary caregiver at home? By primary caregiving, I mean that he's taking care of the household, the child, the older persons at home. Similarly, hegemony is not always equal to dominance. This is very important to understand is because uh, as I mentioned, uh, dominance, it, 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 it has multi-layers. 
So it can also be equal to where a man or a hegemonic man uses certain other tactics, maybe a be of emotions, maybe be it of guilt, maybe of uh, of uh, not giving or uh, of not giving the due credit to uh, to the partner or to women to exercise their own resources and agency. Now, the other part is that masculinity is contested and hegemony is subjective. Now, hegemony is subjective, meaning that as per different countries, there could be and different uh, regions and different ethnicities, hegemony could have different understandings. Now, say in the white world, uh, hegemony could be, as I mentioned, a strong big man who dominates relationships. Maybe in, say, in certain global South country, violence or domestic violence could be an understanding of hegemony. That, uh, you know, about back in time, I was working with the grassroots level organization and young girls uh, under the age of 18, and they had partners who would hit them. And we had to get into a focus group discussion with them to understand how do they feel. And they said that their understanding is that only when a man is jealous or when a man hits them, he really loves them. And that is the way he shows his emotions. And they're very happy with the concept of they being a property of a man. So that is how hegemony uh, travels throughout the globe. Now in Japan, there are very toxic cultures where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, dominance of a man is, 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 is in every zone possible. And it is on the road, it is on the way you take your uh, public transports, everywhere in different discourses, hegemony is displayed. Now, hegemony does not only affect women, it also affects men. Now, we knew when, when the uh, UN Women in 2018, when it was talking about how it is, it is rather, we should celebrate boys displaying their emotions and boys are, boys should be, should be taught to cry and to display their emotions. That is also a part of hegemony. When we teach our boys that they will be timid, they, that they will have a timid personality if they start crying or they display their emotions, we are somehow sabotaging their idea of masculinity. So one, hegemony not just affects women, it also affects men. When men are burdened to become the breadwinners of the family, when men are burdened to not display emotions, when men are not burdened to not have access to mental health resources. Then it also focuses on practice and on personality or behavior. The hegemony says that the entire men group is a homogeneous group. So all the men around the globe, despite of their lived experiences, despite of the regions and the education they need to come from, need to be, behave in a particular way. Like they cannot color their nails, that they cannot dress up in a particular way, that they cannot have long hair, that they cannot uh, uh, be, uh, they cannot help their uh, partners at home, female partners at home in doing household chores. So it, it, is, it, it is idealizing this one particular image of a man. And it also allows a resistance on part of men who are subordinated or marginalized by the hegemonic dominance. But I'm sure Tom would be able to throw some light on it that how indigenous communities and how he said that while he took part in household chores and uh, his access to spirituality, this would be condemned by hegemonic masculinity because these are the areas which are considered feminine, where women should be bracketed and men should not climb on these areas. Similarly, these are certain of the operative words that we, the, we define hegemonic masculinity as confident, tough, a provider, a protector, strong, a leader, aggressive. And why do you culminate on these words? You understand how these words, rather than having a positive effect on how discourses or how society needs to develop, have had such a negative effect, which has trickled down into domestic violence, to sexual and gender-based violence, to intimate partner violence, to, uh, to even subjugation of women rights at the policy level. Now, what are the ill effects of hegemonic masculinity? Now, hegemonic masculinity also means social rejection. As we just discussed, it doesn't only perpetrate to social rejections of women as an uh, important uh, spectrum in the society, but also leads to rejection of uh, men who do not fall into the category, into the popular category of being a man. Similarly, it also leads to, of course, homophobia, because that is even a wider spectrum one needs to talk about, because according to hegemonic masculinity, there are only two genders, women and men. Men who go out and earn money, women who stay at home, 
become the primary caregivers, take care of the child, listen to a man, are subservient to a man. It obviously encourages violence. And, and I would like to pinpoint here as uh, COVID-19, when the COVID-19 pandemic grew, there was also growth of something called a shadow pandemic. A shadow pandemic basically meant that uh, now that there was so much frustration in the hands of men because they were lo losing their jobs, there was restraint on their mobility, there was, uh, there was cut down on their income, there was obviously frustration. And that frustration led to growth in violence and violence, both sexual and uh, domestic violence at home. And now that women were actually staying with their perpetrator, they were not able to have access to, um, to any kind of justice mechanisms. And therefore the numbers that you see around the globe grew by 83% of domestic violence cases in the last one and a half years of the COVID-19 pandemic. It also le leads to suppression of emotions where men are not able to display their emotions of love, of warmth, of vulnerability, which again leads to violence and destruction of images. It also leads to poor behavior control. It actually leads to a lot of health curtailments also when there is so much of pent up anger inside a man, which he, uh, he, he, he subjects a woman to, both in the form of violence and violation. The man himself, a hegemonic man himself goes to a lot of uh, health uh, ailments. And of course, at the end, the family, the entire family spectrum goes for a toss. There are the, the families become dysfunction and the children somehow reap the result of the dysfunctional families. Going to the next one. Now, how do interventions take place? That is the first part of our debate. And that is the core question that why do we need to include women, men and masculinities in the gender equality movement? The important thing here is that um, what we have realized over over uh, the three decades of the feminist movements is alienating men and masculinities from the debate is not solving the purpose. It's rather not going to the core cause of why violence, domestic violence or patriarchal standards exist. Now, if I, as a, as a heterosexual brown woman, I am provided resources, fine enough. But if a man who is next to me is not made aware of his uh, entitlement, of certain amount is privileged, then there is no gender equality. I am getting educated, but what about the other man? What about, uh, about the man who also needs awareness as to his positionality? And therefore, inclusion of men and masculinities in the debate is extremely important. Now, the ill effects of it is that 18.7 million men living with HIV, there are 18.7 Indian men who are living right now with HIV AIDS. And out of that, one in four are young boys. Now, HIV AIDS is also how we understand HIV AIDS as a concept of hegemonic masculinity is that men think that using a condom is, uh, is uh, you are somehow emasculating a man. A man doesn't need to wear a condom on, or, or needs to practice safe sex. A woman needs to have the pill, despite understanding that uh, a woman has a womb. My body is not a guinea pig for medical interventions. That was again a concept made by patriarchy. The intervention should be on a man. A man should be, uh, should be practicing birth control, not me. I have a womb and therefore I need to give birth. And the safe uh, access needs to be for a man and not for a woman. But because men are not educated about it, they refuse to practice safe sex and therefore they are the sufferers of a massive uh, increase in HIV AIDS. Similarly, HIV AIDS is more transmitted from M to M by M to M and M to W, I, uh, I mean. M to M is men to men relationship, basically uh, homosexual relationships. So when hegemonic masculinity does not recognize that gender is a wide spectrum, you, gender does not mean a man and a woman. And therefore we are not able to have interventions when uh, a homosexual couple wants to have a sexual interaction. That is when uh, hegemonic, that, that is when HIV AIDS cases also increase. Similarly, one sixth of the world's sexual crimes are committed and are perpetrated by young men. So this also happens from what children learn from dysfunction families that when a man, when a father hits a mother, when a father commits domestic violence on a mother, initially a child is moved, but when that keeps happening, a child subconsciously makes a belief that this is how the world functions. And, a, and a specifically a boy is always taught to be like his father. 
And when he sees his father to be in uh, to be such a toxic man, he thinks this is how the world is, and this is how I will be respected. And therefore, a young boy who could be nurtured to become an, a, a contributing factor to the society becomes a perpetrator. Similarly, boys' violence has also been reported as number one repercussions of boys will be boys. So that is a that is a some that is one discourse that needs to be fought to the core. Like when we empower girls, the most important empowerment has to be done with boys. You, we cannot tell our girls that okay, after eight o'clock, do not go out or put your parents on a SOS call. It doesn't matter. We are going back to the patriarchal beliefs where we think that the world is not safe for women. More than that, we need to make our boys aware that rather than committing crimes, you need to be contributing factors where all genders and all people feel safe. Similarly, 78% men are resistant to seek mental and physical health. And that is why you would see specifically in countries like even in the US where suicide rates of men are so high. When uh, FORO, FORO was granted during the pandemic and then when the rights were taken away, there were so many epidemics of suicide, suicidal rates. Why? Because Mental and physical health services are supposed to be feminine. Men are not supposed to go to mental health clinics. Similarly, there are prejudice, hostility, denial, and misconceptions towards uh, MSM. MSM, again, men-to-men -men relationships are higher in young men. Now, styles of interaction in intimate relationships are also rehearsed during adolescence. As I mentioned, a child learns from what he sees in a society. If he learns in his society that a man is supposed to be a dominant figure. A man can hit and hit, hitting a woman or committing violence over a woman is another way of showing hard love. He is going to take forward the same bait and commit those sowing crimes, even if at a very impressionable age. And um, it is also a cost effect reason where young men are more willing and pragmatic than adult men. So ed intervention is specifically required with young men and young boys because it's an easier model. A young man to be schooled, to be taught about the correct norms, to be taught about feminist practices, to be acquainted to the needs and, uh, and, uh, and requirements of the other genders, that is still an easier intervention than as an intervention uh, with, the, with the mature adults. Now, what are the techniques that we can adopt? First is definitely gender advocacy, where we can, we can have training manuals, workshops, uh, we can have uh, focus group discussions where men and masculinities need to be involved. They need to be acquainted with what women grow through. They need to be, there needs to be open discussion about periods. There need to be open uh, discussion about postpartum depression, about what a woman's body goes through during, uh, during uh, uh, childbirth. What is sexual pleasure for women? These are not supposed to be taboo topics. These are to be topics which are supposed to be brought out in the open and discussed with, with as much uh, credibility as the other topics. Similarly, HIV AIDS needs to, de needs to be destigmatized. Uh, one of the primary, primary reasons for this is that in India, uh, there was a lot of growth. We had massive numbers of HIV. We still have them, but back in the 90s, we have great numbers of HIV AIDS. Also because sex or sexual intercourse was a taboo topic. And because these are taboo topics, their safe access is also taboo, which means that uh, condoms or uh, birth control pills or the or having uh, honesty in a relationships are not discussed. Then third is sexual and reproductive health and rights of women. I conducted a study back in time in uh, for adolescent girls between the age of 15 and 18 coming from underprivileged families in India. And it basically was a study to understand that how aware young girls are about their sexual and reproductive rights. And to our amazement, uh, Underprivileged girls coming from villages from India showed around 78% of them were active in having sexual intercourse with the, uh, with the, uh, were active in, uh, in uh, sexual intercourses, which meant that they were having sex, but without having prior knowledge of having sex. And also these were underage girls. So they did not know about safe, uh, about uh, having safe sex. They did not know about what could be violence in sex. They did not understand consent. So debates, discussions over sexual and reproductive health rights are also supposed to be one, can be one technique of intervention. And the last is to counter violence. 
just making, just having debates about violence is not going to be enough. We need to have very strict criminal laws and justice mechanism against violence. Uh, in India, uh, uh, rape or any kind of violence uh, is a criminal offense, but the problem with uh, countries like India is that because we are a 1.4 billion population and uh, there is always a lot of pendency in the courts, the time, by the time these uh, cases reach their uh, stage of justice, either the victim has died or the victim has moved on. And that is why a lot of victims are not even able to move to the courts. And even the intervention machinery is not safe. Uh, sometimes very triggering questions are asked. Uh, they do not maintain a certain amount of decorum as to what questions uh, of, of somebody who has been uh, who has been a survivor of domestic violence or sexual and gender-based violence how are you supposed to intervene in that matter? That kind of understanding has not been given. And therefore, women do not even move to the courts or any, any kind of adjusted mechanism to seek recourse. So we have talked about this. So in conclusion, uh, hegemonic masculinity basically is not more about gender, but it's about power. Who holds the power? It, between, as we discussed, even between men as a group, a heteronormative man, which I mean a straight, a heterosexual white man coming from the global north, having privileges is com considered highest of the pedestals. And then we trickle down to the other, other uh, associations of masculinity. So it's all about power. Similarly, intervention programs need to accommodate fluidity and dynamism and look at a long-term change. We definitely cannot have one mode of intervention. As, as Tom mentioned, Interventions for, uh, for, um, for indigenous community would have to take into consideration their spirituality, their culture, their understanding of religion, their understanding of family dynamics. What works in say, uh, in Florida cannot works in, work in West Virginia. Similarly, what works in India cannot work in the UK. So we cannot have what, what you're taught in the global North cannot trickle down to say West Africa. We have to, these, all these interventions have to take into consideration culture and the associations that people come from. And the last is that theoretical evidence need to be woven with activism. Anytime a policy that is made and that I have seen over years, we somehow miss the work of the grassroots level organization. What we think that we people who speak fluent English, who come from, uh, from these uh, you know, Ivy League colleges and good universities, we are the ones who are making policies. But at the end of the day, I cannot be talking about what a black woman, say in Namibia, goes through from my elitist point of view when I am only doing research in a library. My positionality is only of a researcher. We have to have representations from the people or from the survivors of domestic violence, not from people who sit on the ivory tower and make policies. Yeah, so that will be all from me. Wow. Miss Mahajan. <laughs> I feel like that Amazing. was- Amazing. Yes, it was such a comprehensive discussion of the, all of the drivers of this patriarchal, it's like a, what is that thing that they had on the on the cows? It's like this this thing over our shoulders that we have to bear the burden of constantly, constantly. Um, you know, that was just such a comprehensive discussion of everything. Um, I just was floored at the depth that needed to like be unpacked with breakout groups, with discussions, with journaling to get people to integrate that information. And I think I might just have to invite you to do that with us. Um, anytime, anytime. Thank you so much, Ollie. At some point, yes, we need to like figure out how we can get this information out to the world. Um, teach it in schools. I'm going to get into some of those schools, let me tell you right now. 
um, because we, we really need to get a program into the schools, a, a scaffolded program that builds from elementary through middle through high school, um, particularly in westernized culture. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whoo, that was great. Tom did say that he went to pick up his dear wife who um, initially was supposed to be having a discussion with him uh, before our next speak speaker to come, Dr. Kapoor. So in, in staying with you though, I'm just letting you know what's happening around you, right? Um, I did wanna open it up to anybody in the audience here on Zoom and then also on Clubhouse. I'm gonna check and see what's happening on Facebook as well. So if anybody wishes to unmic, are you open to taking questions? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, beautiful. All right, so there, it's been put out. And if anybody desires to ask any questions based on the slides or previous discussion, her incredible bio, Okay, if you want to know anything else about what she does in the world, please feel free to unmic and speak at this time. I'm going on mic. Don't be shy, people. The term hegemonic masculinity is that what a phrase is that you coined that? Did no, you no, point no. That? no, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all. No, that's a very, very old uh, gender discourse word. And I don't remember who coined it, but it was also to set the voice forward that, uh, you know, this, this notion about feminist of these angry women who are out on the road burning bras need to really, really chill down. We are not angry women. Yes, we have been marginalized and we are not against men. And that notion also needs to really, really be negated. We are against hegemony of any gender. It's an equal world. And when you, when you put men on a certain kind of men who have certain kind of attributes on the head of the entire debate, we are not just negating women. We are also negating men who might behave differently, who might have different aspirations. And that is how you see there are so many men who are so hesitant to take up careers, say in fashion designing, or being a barber, or being chefs in hotels, because those kind of careers are supposed to be careers where women are supposed to be taken. So it's, it's a downplay even on economy. Why should one gender only contribute to certain attributes where their real skill set is in certain other sectors. So if you look at it from the point of view of the GDP of a country or the economy, the economy also suffers. So no, I did not coin that word at all. No, because I was, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there, there was a presenter earlier on, Dr. Spencer. And I'm thinking that based on what it is you're saying and what he is saying, a marrying of both your, not presentations, but both your philosophies, would augur well for his programs, like Lauren was saying, that's a scaffolding program for schools, um, but also for men as well, um, to ease them into it, <laughs> so to speak. That would be my um, I was thinking so, the exact same thing, Sarah Jane. What's that? I think I was thinking the exact same thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, because I think the men who are currently actually trying to do differently, a program, a scaffolding program like Laurel suggested would ease them into a better, clearer understanding. Laurel is all, developing. Laurel is developing it as we speak, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bring them into a clar clarifying number of things that they take for granted that they, they had not even considered. Um, and you, I think you pointed us in a direction that a lot of people did not think that we could go, but we can. Of course, of course. And as, as women, we actually need to now not look at radical approaches because they are not sustaining. Throughout the globe, we have these radical dictators who are at, as the head of the state. And what have we achieved during COVID? 
there were just two countries which had feminists, which had, which had women leadership were the ones, the countries that were doing very well. And what were the other countries doing? Banning their borders for refugees or uh, bombarding the other countries or uh, taking away the resources from the other countries and not even giving an apology. So what is really important is to get holistic views on board and for people to be aware that when they have the power of making decisions for the state and for the people, they cannot take it from their own learning, learned experiences. There has to be constant learning. And therefore, representation of women is so important. I used to have this debate quite often in school where I am a huge supporter of the quota system of representation for women. And there was this debate that, you know, why do we need quota? There has to be quality. You, uh, when we, women are asked for, asked for quota, they are basically saying that they are not equal to men. The debate here is that they are not positioned equally. How do I even aim to become the president of India when I have no role model as female presidents? Because there's no representation. As a young girl growing up in India or a young girl growing up in the US, if she has never seen a female president, how will she ever want to venture on that way? And that is why representation of women, specifically with regard to specific quotas is necessary because it's not equal. It will be equal when there is a 50-50 distribution at the board of directors or board of decision makers. Right now, it's not equal. We do not have role models. A very small example of this is that when Tony Blair came to power in the UK and he did a tokenistic representation of women where he had three women in the parliament, the English media quoted them on the national daily as Tony's bitches. And these women, despite of being on the parliament, were not able to move one policy for women because just three representation will not count. You're competing other against two thirds of the parliament who think, no, I mean, why is it necessary? Why are we supposed to tone down our, bocalo, our boys locker uh, talk when women are around? That's inconvenience. Or why are we supposed to have specific restrooms for women? Or why are women supposed to require leaves on periods? Or, uh, or a, we don't require maternity leaves, but rather we should give paternity leaves because a child is an equal responsibility even of, the, of, uh, of a man. And why should only a woman take care of a child, even if she is through maternity leaves? And therefore, the leaves need to be needs to be parental and not just maternal. So these discussions will only come to the fore when there's equal representation. A very small example is that um, recently the US and the UK sent a delegation to Afghanistan for peace talks with Taliban. I mean, and these peace talks were on women, peace and security, that women are targeted that under 14, the fatwa against under 14 women is that, under 14 girls is that they will be married off to the warriors. The entire delegation was of men. There was not a single woman on board. How are you talking about women, peace and security without having women? This doesn't make sense. And that is why we really need to get to the grassroots and understand that where does this power dynamics come from? It comes from the households. It comes when boys are not taught to celebrate, to, uh, to even talk to the girls in a proper way. As, as, uh, the, as Tom mentioned, boundaries, knocking at doors, of not checking your partner's phone, of asking whether they have different needs, of asking what, how, what kind of sexual pleasure gratifies them. These are the discussions which do not have to be closeted. These needs need to come out in open and need to be discussed in the broad plenary. All right. Callie, how are you? Callie um, is oh. very quiet, but if you can um, just, if you can introduce yourself, because I'm not sure if you're at work. Callie actually works with refugees, um, ladies and gentlemen. And I met her on an app and she is, oh, good. So she says she's at her internship. She sent me a direct message. Um, she said, sorry, apologies, everyone. So she's at work right now. So unfortunately, she's not able to come off my and speak, but that's who she, that's the population that she works with. She works with refugees. Um, Callie, if you could just put in the, um, where are you? Because I know it's somewhere in like middle America that they, they landed you. Originally, she is from um, Oceania. So she's in Kansas, she says. 
All right. So yeah, originally she's from Oceania. So she is also, by the way, indigenous. And uh, yeah, Callie, parentage. <laughs> Jump it in the chat <laughs> so they know where you're from. I'm trying to make sure everybody knows who's here. Um, and uh, Tom Plenty Chief is back with his wife, and he said he, he has the boss, <laughs> so she is she is with him right now. So Tom, anytime you're ready to come back, uh, let me know. So she's Pacific Islander. Can you can you all see this? Oh yes, good. She sent it to everybody. So it's in the chat, all right? And Fiji. All right. That's that's the gorgeousness that's going on over there. And Tom says he's ready. So any final and she sends love. <laughs> you know how to work the Zoom thing, Miss Kelly. I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna have you facilitate future meetings. Okay. All right. Yeah, I know you're looking at me. So <laughs> Tom is ready. Any final questions for Ms. Mahajan? All right, I agree. Awesome presentation. It also came through from Clubhouse as well. We really appreciate you being here and teaching us about all of these things. Now people have to look up what hegemony is. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what's going on there. They're like, what is that? It all starts from the thesaurus. Trust me, it all starts from the thesaurus. <laughs> well, just know that you're going to be hearing from me about, I think this, this same identical conversation I would like to have with you on a LinkedIn Live. So if you have room within the next week to do this on LinkedIn Live with me, my audience on there is, I think, like 5,000 people between followers and the 3,000 plus that I have in my immediate network, okay? So I think it needs to get out to more people, and that's the place to do it. The other place we're going to have this wonderful conversation, just so you know, is Twitter spaces. Because when I open Twitter spaces, people just seem to come in from all over. They're just like, what is she talking about? Who is Witsy and what are they about? So when they come in, they usually stay. And they're like, we always learn when we come into Witsy's Twitter spaces when everybody else is talking about crap. So <laughs> that's the other place that we are going to be spreading this information because that's how we get information out there by creating these ripple effects so that people know that people like you exist because right now they don't know about this information but we're going to bring it to them on mass platforms okay mm -hmm. all right so that's what we're about and that's what we're going to do any final words for us any encouragement around call to action what would you say um, and people are, are, are pinging me and dinging me. So I'm going to look at what they have to say. And then um, I'm going to have you say what you'd like to say finally. I think I'm, I'm very, um, as I mentioned, I, have, I, I definitely do not have a positionality to preach. But all I can sh share from how my network or whatever I've learned from people around me is to always have open ears to learn. And not to be rigid about your learnings or your understanding of things. It is so important to hear conversations, to celebrate diversity and uh, to hear people from the indigenous community, to hear people who are refugees, who are immigrants, people who come from different color and different ethnicity backgrounds, know their childhood stories, know what their mother cooked at home, know what dreams they shared while they were growing up, because this really frames us to a society which celebrates differences. And that is where our learning belongs to. If we all stay in our own circles, in our own ethnic groups, then there will never be growth. Then there will never be celebration or respect for diversity or difference of opinion. And democracy, as a matter of fact, requires different opinions. It is, all, it is only when we stop respecting them is when democracy becomes like a huge burden. So uh, we need to have more plot, uh, we have need to have more uh, engaging dialogue from WITC so that we can have more people to talk about you know, there's the things that are really personal to them, like how when Tom was sharing how he met his wife through a spiritual, uh, spiritual, uh, I mean, uh, the spiritual outreach that he was at. And I uh, am uh, also highly spiritual. I've 
follow Nichiren Daishinin's Buddhism. I'm 14th year into the practice. And I could so relate when he was talking about spirituality with so much compassion, because I completely understand how anchoring spirituality is. So we need to have dialogues about more personal antics rather than talking about these sham talks and having these small talks. You know, they really don't add up. Let's talk about real stuff and let's have celebrate diversity to its core. So that's just my two time takeaway. Oh, I always find that connecting with spiritual people, regardless of what their spiritual practice is, deepens the conversation right the length and the breadth of the conversation becomes that much more profound because you understand that we are primarily here for a spiritual purpose we may be physical beings but we have a higher spiritual purpose so i i believe that you get that you understand that and that's awesome thank you so much for being a light beacon in this world. <laughs> Keep shining your bright light everywhere, educating and advocating and being your stunning, stellar, sensational, brilliant self. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, Tom, anytime you are ready and I'm seeing awesome presentation and uh, People are just very grateful for this new information, new knowledge. Okay. And I'm gonna have to check in with Facebook in a little bit and see what's going on over there. But it's just a lot of screens. I'm like managing three screens right now. And Tom is back. So thank you so much. Deep gratitude for being here, both of you and for Palavi. Palavi. We, we <coughs> no, thank you. So this is the lady that saved my life. Her name is Lori Ray, Funny Chief. Um, her um, indigenous name is Black Otter Woman. That's how you say it in a softness language. And um, she's a member of the Mandan and Hiradza tribe of our, uh, of our MHA nation. She comes from the um, Good Bird and Finley families from Mandaree in uh, Newtown, uh, North Dakota. Again, residing on our traditional territories of the um, Mandan, Hiradza, Rikra people. So that's our uh, introduction. I already introduced myself, and I think all the same people are in here, so we'll just kind of go along with that. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, beautiful wife. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're so thrilled to meet you. Um, he posts your pictures on his, on his, uh, I saw a picture of you on his PTR one time and I saw when he sent me the picture, unlike the other men who sent pictures, he sent a picture with you <laughs> for his bio. And <laughs> that well, said a lot to me. That's yeah, I got that number. He's coming to conference right now, so you're gonna have to write it down, okay? Yeah. So we appreciate I'm in a conference right now. So you're gonna to have to write it down. Thank you. We basically have about 37, yeah, okay. 36 minutes that we okay, would please. till the next speaker arrives. Um, he's gonna be talking about grief and loss, Dr. Kapal. That is his specialization. So you have 37 minutes to say and educate us, ask questions, anything you want to put us through here to help us to figure out how we can yeah, move it's, um, all of the conversations around around violence towards really native and because we know about the missing, murdered, and, and indigenous. 7062. Okay. So that's huge. And I would love for, for Tom to speak to, to that. Because I know that he's not here. Okay, I got no, I gotta go. And then I right, love you, son. See ya. I would love for you all to speak more about the native, the Native American church, because I know you're involved with that. So we were just talking while you were you were talking about what we could frame the next 35 minutes or so around 
till our next speaker gets here. He's going to be Dr. Kapal talks about grief and loss, traumatic grief and loss. If we have it, how to deal with it, how to mitigate it. Okay, which is a huge part, unfortunately, of domestic violence. So I know that you have been working with the Missing, Murdered, and Indigenous Women um, movement. So we would love to find out as much as possible. Are, are, the, do, are those our relatives that want to come say hi? It's okay. They can come say hi. We're good with that. I'm good with kids. <laughs> they can come say hi so they can get it out of their system. They're like, who are all of these weird people in this street? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So anything that you'd like to speak to, you have the mic. Okay. Well, um, should we start out? Okay. Um, well, for the, um, you know, uh, missing and murdered, I guess it, I guess it was, it's a movement, they say. Um, it started out with like missing and murdered uh, indigenous women. And then it went to missing and murdered indigenous women who spirited, what was the other one? There was a, there was kind of like, and then the next one that they came out with was um, missing and murdered indigenous relatives. So on our, um, so that just kind of encompasses everybody, um, men, women, children, you know, two spirited, however, human beings, basically, you know, whatever a human being is, you know, whatever, however they uh, define themselves and like that, you know, but being a part of um, indigenous tribes, of the uh, 572 tribes of uh, the United States. And I think there's like 640 or something around there in Canada. And then, then uh, you know, for our people, we also, you know, count, you know, indigenous people in like uh, Mexico and that area, that land, you know, we call the whole thing, North America, we call it Turtle Island. So from the top of it, you know, to the very bottom where the tail is at, you know, all the indigenous people that are from there, you know, we count them and like where, uh, where, like where Laurel is from, you know, those are indigenous relatives too. And then they, uh, <clears throat> so since, um, you know, right around 1492 or somewhere around there, you know, Columbus, um, you know, came from Spain and he was looking for India and he kind of ended up coming around uh, Laurel's um, area down there. And then, um, you know, since then, you know, it's been, uh, you know, millions, millions of people, you know, through history, you know, through time, you know, every, you know, every tribe has been affected, you know, by that, you know, through time, you know, a lot of people think it's a, um, it's a really recent thing, but, you know, it's been going on, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 2000, about another 70 years, it'll be 600 years that it's been happening, you know, to our people. And that's kind of the, I was um, say that that's worldwide, you know, wherever you find indigenous people, you find the same story, you know, with um, um, colonial uh, power, I guess, Britain, France, you know, countries like that, you know, wanting to take over, you know, lay claim to the land, you know, put their uh, Spain, you know, put their kind of uh, rule down uh, to the people there, you know, so, so it's been going on, you know, 500 and some years as it is. And uh, so, uh, so through that, you know, we've had to learn, learn English and, you know, um, I myself, I'm not a first language speaker, neither is my wife, you know, it's just something that we practice on, you know, a um, few of our kids are kind of involved with that, you know, trying to revitalize the language. And then there's, um, you know, so with that, it goes hand in hand with, the, with this uh, deal, what they call it is historical trauma. So after, you know, they tried to eradicate us through warfare, and then they tried to eradicate us, our people, through um, starvation. And then they, um, you know, they killed, like in our area, they, um, they made, a, uh, made a conscious effort to kill all the buffalo that they could. So, so we wouldn't have anything to eat. It would kind of force our people to go, go to the reservation and they give out what they call rations. You know, usually when they got those rations, the government, you know, they would, uh, they would, um, they would take out all the best, like the agent or the superintendent of the, of the, you know, it's kind of basically a war camp, you know, prisoners of war. And they would, um, 
they would take the best, they would give, you know, the flour would be full of worms or, you know, meat would be rotten or they just give all the scraps and, you know, they wouldn't give the good, any good, they would keep all that and sell it. <clears throat> and then, uh, then through time, you know, they, um, the next thing they decided to do was, um, um, you know, they had that uh, constitution, you know, it says in there, uh, merciless Indian savages, you know, so when they say uh, people, you know, United States of America, I, you know, they, um, it says it in the constitution. Well, it says that too, concerning our people and that we are, we are a problem, you know, so that's historical fact. You know, they always talk about that, uh, that theory, critical race theory, and, 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 and that's a part of it because there's people that deny it's not a theory, it's, it's historical fact. And then there's people that deny and they say that, that, um, that it's a theory and that stuff really didn't happen and they try to make it, you know, less than it is, but it, it's, it's the truth, you know, and, and the only way to prevent that from happening again is to, is to make people aware of what happened and then to teach them, you know, um, to be good, kind, loving relatives, you know, to everybody. That's the only way that we're going to make, make it all together as human beings on this uh, mother earth is to be kind to one another and helpful and encouraging you know, just the same way we tell our kids, our family, you know, and then, um, so then after that, you know, then I moved on to boarding schools and then they, um, you know, through the boarding schools, you know, they, um, they tried to, you know, they would take them when they're kids, you know, about five years old, they couldn't speak their language, keep them in those boarding schools, you know, and then while they're there, you know, they're getting raped, molested and killed, you know, the ones that made it back, the survivors, you know, they survived that, you know, being, you know, being in that, that prison, you know, all those years, then they come home and then they're all kind of, you know, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually kind of out of line, you know, kind of unbalanced and having a hard time. And then, and then they stay around and they have families, but they don't know how to express themselves. And then that goes on to the next generation, you know, because there's, they're not, they're not speaking love or they're not, they're not speaking encouragement. They're not speaking their language. You know, they're just doing what they just doing what they were told basically you know, at the boarding schools. And then somewhere along there, you know, there came some uh, some change, you know, like with the ceremonial way of life and the chieftainship and all that stuff. It turned in, you know, people started, um, you know, going to church and stuff like that. And so that's good. You know, that's good to pray that way, but they uh, they, they left their, their own ways behind and continued on with that. With the church ways and stuff, and, you know, that's, that's how they want to pray. It's okay. You know, the main thing is that they're praying and they see the good, they, they follow the goodness of it, you know, and then, uh, then they, um, and so on and so forth, you know, then we have like kind of like a cowboy generation, you know, it's still some that way, ranchers and things like that. And then that brings us to this uh, kind of modern days now, you know, where they have, uh, you know, things like computers and cell phones and, you know, stuff like that, you know, <clears throat> and then, um, so now we have uh, oil field. More recently, around 2008 or so, they, they knew that, you know, there was oil here. Everyone knew it, but then it started with that fracking and uh, horizontal uh, drilling. So, so when that happened, then people started coming in, you know, our local area, a lot of faces that we don't know. And, you know, some of them, we had some, uh, some intentions that, you know, wasn't good, you know, for lady folk or young girls, you know, especially. And then, um, so we've had some uh, relatives around here that have uh, gone missing and murdered, you know, out of well, some well-known, you know, well-known um, cases, you know, around here. Um, <clears throat> so we, we try to be involved in that. Uh, there's, you know, there are, sometimes they'll have awareness walks and, uh, you know, they'll ask us to go over there and support, walk with them. And then sometimes uh, they'll have like a, in the Black Hills, they always have one right around the time of Sturgis. They always have a bike run, missing and murdered. And it's all mainly all native people. They ride bikes and then they raise money. I guess they pay so much to ride. And then after that, they give the money they raise to this other organization called uh, Sonish Scouts. Um, that's my uh, one of my cousins, my sister. Um, she runs that and she's um, her name is Lissa Gillibird Chase. You might have heard of her. If not, look her up. She wrote, they wrote a book about her. Lissa Yellowbird Chase. And, uh, she uh, she goes all over 
you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota. I think she was down in the Four Corners area, Arizona, <clears throat> around there. You know, she looks for, for um, relatives and she just kind of has a knack for it. She has a couple of dogs. And we've, we've tried to support her and help her. You know, we bought them a, a little like a raft so they could get into sloughs, you know, stuff like that. And then just try to be there and, you know, supportive, supportive of her, or whatever she's doing. You know, so it's really a, um, <clears throat> it's really a, um, it's really a big thing, you know, because these uh, relatives, they go missing and it's, it's, it's every day. You know, it happens every day, you know, all across the, um, all across this country here, wherever there's indigenous people, you know, they, um, they have, that happens. You know, Rapid City is a bad one. You know, people, a lot of, a lot of young girls go missing there. You know, they never, uh, you know, all over Black Hills and all the area around there, you know. Um, well, there's a relative down in um, Cheyenne River. His name is um, Spirit. He went missing um, about a month and a half ago. They're, they're looking for him still. You know, so it's just it's something that, that's continuing on. I think what we need is uh, awareness of it, um, some walks and things like that. And then also, you know, I think we need to be uh, a little bit more proactive to take care of ourselves too. You know, as far as, uh, you know, somebody shouldn't be saying because, you know, somebody shouldn't be thinking that way. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to say, but our women and, and our men, everyone of our people, we should be able to go any place we want and, and be safe. You know, we shouldn't have to worry about it. We shouldn't even have to, you know, tell people that that's not right. But somehow in their mind, you know, that's how it is. You know, and then, uh, so I think that, you know, people, like, you know, especially lady folk, you know, went around like, you know, not, don't go around alone. It's, it's sad to say that in this time and day, it's sad to say that, to not go around by themselves, not get, to not be in, like, don't go around places where they're drinking or getting high, you know, don't walk around by yourself, you know, someone could just, just like that, you know, snatch them up and never see them again. And we've heard that, you know, like in Canada, they have this, uh, they have like a trail that goes across and it goes on that, uh, that east side of Canada by Quebec or someplace over there. And then they take them to a port and then they take them across and like there's this whole network, take them to Europe. If they don't, if they don't, um, if they don't make the trip, then just put them in the ocean, take the ones that live, take them to Europe and then they kind of do what they're going to do with them and and that's it you know so then all these uh families you know this of course the one that, the ones that that happens to you know you're never going to see them again their, their, their spirit is always going to be um is always going to be you know kind of sad and no closure to be able to move on you know to the next world and then uh and then and at the same time their family too you know they don't have that closure they, they they're always going to wonder always kind of hoping that they're maybe around still, you know, somewhere, and, you know, so it's a real big thing, you know, it's a real big thing, and I know that, that throughout the world, you know, Australia, same thing, Africa, same thing, you know, India, same thing, uh, you know, Oriental, you know, Orient, you know, that whole area, Southeast, you know, Asia, same thing, you know, any place you go, any place you go, Hawaii, you know, Islanders, Pacific Islanders, you know, same thing all over the world, all over the world, they've all been going through the same thing. And, you know, it affects us too, you know, as uh, indigenous people on this uh, Turtle Island, you know, and it, um, you know, there's not, there's not very many of us either, you know, so it really, um, it really affects us, you know, in our communities. You know, we had, like I said, we had, uh, um, we had one over here um, that was kind of more well-known. Her name was um, Olivia uh, Lone Bear, you know, that was kind of a well-known well-known deal. And then, uh, there was another one a few years back. I will. 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 I will
same thing. One was working and he just went missing. He was at work and he just went missing from work. Nobody knew what happened, you know, supposedly. You know, nothing happened with the investigation. There was another one in this, uh, another family that, you know, somebody's land and, you know, something happened there and, you know, nothing. Family's still asking for answers. You know, so it's a really big thing, you know, that's the best thing we could do is um, have awareness and then and take care of ourselves, you know, surround ourselves with good people. I just tell these, uh, even these ladies, even my wife here, you know, I tell her, don't go around by yourself. And if I'm not with her, then make sure you're, by, make sure you're with somebody. Even if it's going to Walmart or whatever, you know, there's been times that she's been followed around in Walmart, you know, by uh, other people. Kind of bother her and all that, you know, so she had to get on the phone and call somebody and, you know, kind of keep walking around Walmart until they showed up. And as soon, soon as somebody showed up, you know, she wasn't alone. And those other men folk, you know, they just walked away, away from her. Left her alone. Then after that, they, they left, you know, they left Walmart and they left the parking lot. You know, they checked and they seen them leaving, you know, so she could have been a victim too. You know, that's sad to say, you know, it could happen to anyone. You know, so that's a um, kind of our take on it. You know, we try to be involved and try to be um, supportive as we can, you know, do do as much as we can. You know, what, what we're able to, you know, humble efforts. I'll just give my, uh, here, give Lori a little bit of time here too. Same thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that is right up the line of, of exactly what we're going to be exploring more. Tom, you and I can talk about that because we received some funding. And so with that funding, we're going to begin a documentary about this stuff that nobody is covering because somebody needs to cover it, okay? And I want to do it, of course, from an indigenous lens. I, I don't need the white people to come in here telling our stories and telling the stories of our relatives. Is that more of the same? It's more of the same. More of them sensationalizing everything for the moment, and spotlighting yeah. for the moment, and and the rest of the time. Yeah. So it needs to be an ongoing conversation. Thank you so much um, for sharing all of that. I I really appreciate so much profoundly you being here, and I'm feeling the energy around. And I don't know where all of this is going to land, but I hope it moves all of our peoples forward and helps us in some way with the things that we are, are challenged with, we are suffering through, um, we are traumatized by on a daily basis. Oh, Miss Lori, I've heard about you. <laughs> <laughs> From your husband, he honored my respect from the very first time I heard him speak because he talked about, you know, he found out what I did and he said, yeah, we, we don't have that problem as much within my culture and this is how we do things. And I was just like, okay, I don't know how, but I need you to see that on camera because that needs to be spread far and wide, exactly what you're seeing here. <laughs> so I can't believe the day has come because he probably was like, who is this person bothering me about what now? <laughs> <laughs> and here we are having this conversation. So it is truly my delight to have you here. There are people in the room on Zoom. There are people um, listening in on clubhouse i haven't checked it in a little bit and then there are also people um viewing all day long on facebook live because we're also streaming it to facebook live we're also going to be sending this up and up uploading it to youtube and um, to linkedin linkedin as well in linkedin we have uh, just about five thousand plus people that we're connected to from the immediate people to the followers. So it's going to go out to a large number of people. So feel free to share any messages that you feel are critical to share, please. <clears throat> okay, um, I'll try here. I uh, kind of wrote some stuff down here as um, he was talking and <clears throat> He was talking about, um, you know, awareness, and I feel like, you know, those um, awareness events and um, kind of they 
they have a spiritual aspect to them and, you know, create like a spiritual movement, putting that out into the universe. And, you know, we want those kinds of things to leave our people alone. And um, <clears throat> so I guess it's something going back to like the historical um, trauma and the, the intergenerational trauma and how that kind of changed our genetic um, makeup and how we respond in situations and um, in, in my own mind, I feel like that that changes something within your your body and how you respond to, I guess, stress and, you know, and it came from before us and before us and before us. And um, so I feel like if something so negative can happen to to uh, change how we respond and what kind of situations we put ourselves into, that we could um, make the efforts and the movements to try to be healthy within our own selves, break these cycles that are keeping our people sick. And um, in doing that, we, um, we change that, that chemical makeup, that, uh, that response and, and to respond in a more healthy way that changes within us, us as women, we can carry children and it could be something positive with, with us just putting in our own efforts and like you have a child and I feel like those can be passed down negative, negative while it can happen positive too. So if we, if we um, do, do the work and we, um, we want to become, you know, have a better balance uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and we become that, and our children see that, that it could be um, positive, you know, and, and hopefully it's more of like a, like a movement, a whole movement instead of just like a moment in time and like, okay, yeah, this is what we're doing, then that ends, let's do something else, you know, but to continue that and keep it going because um it takes a lot of work you know to to break those cycles and to um want to be okay so I feel like the um um reconnection with our spirituality you know because um our ancestors you know they were okay it's in our DNA to to be that way and to revitalize that and kind of rekindle that within our own selves. And I feel like it, it could um, happen, like I said, through the, the reconnection, the revitalization of even our languages and um, through like love, um, compassion, patience, some understanding through um, just how we are. And we just be that way. We learn, we learn that we be that way. And it just kind of, the positive can follow down too. So I feel like um, that's a, a good thing. And um, something that I, <laughs> that I work on, you know, and it's, uh, <clears throat> it's good. Am I, am I sensing you getting emotional? Around <laughs> okay. and and I see and I see your loving husband taking care of you which is awesome to witness in real yeah. time, in real time this happening that's awesome yep so could you speak to me about what what's behind the emotion the emotional charge that's coming up what what is happening um I, I'm sorry. I think, um, we apologize. No need to what apologize. it is, is, uh, to witness the, the hurt and the trauma and the, uh, all the social ills and, you know, that, that keep continuing mm. and how that makes us feel mm. is hurtful. Yes. But then on the other side of that, how, um, 
with the efforts and you know the the time spent on one's own self worth and um, um self confidence on the opposite side of that how beautiful it can be for somebody and uh, just to wish that for people you know to uh, be happy be happy in their lives and be okay through their own efforts wow oh there's so much there yeah so i'm hearing the compassion that you hold for people and the empathy that you hold for other people suffering you're also seeing how much your you and other people struggle just for in self care and self and and the yeah. struggle you know, yeah and i'm yeah. Also, yeah and i'm also hearing you talking really with the voice of your people about what you're witnessing the struggles around yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's heavy. That feels heavy. Energetically, I'm feeling you on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling you on that. That, that feels, heavy. that feels heavy. Ooh, okay. So we've been doing a lot of breathing today in this room. So, <laughs> you know, ooh, yeah, right. Sometimes you just got to breathe it out, drink water. Because it is a lot of stuff, you know, because the patriarchy, this colonialist system that we're still under, frankly, because it's everywhere, it's embedded in all the systems. So I just want to, um, yeah, thank you, Callie, for being here. I saw your note and um, one of our relatives, she, she's about to go, she was at work, I guess she's on her way home now. And so what I, what I would love to hear from you is in terms of actionable things, what do you feel like an organization like the Women's Institute for Trauma Survivors International? It's not just woman owned, but I am mixed indigenous. I do recognize all my bloods. And what's interesting is I'm so mixed, it's ridiculous. However, where I feel most at home, where I most identify, and because I really was raised with the connection to my mother's family and not my father's family. And my mother's family is Kalanago, right? My father's family is Scottish. And, you know, there's some kind of slave ancestry there as well. However, I most identify with my mother's culture because that's really who I was raised around, my mother's grandparents, you know, my mother's parents. Um, so that's where my, not just allegiance is, but also where I resonate. Because I have these unusual things that, you know, about me, people call them gifts, people call them whatever. It's just unusual to most people that only when I'm with my people do, do I feel comfortable and they understand and I don't have to, you know, do the whole song and dance explaining myself. So what do you think are some of the actionable things that we can do? Help me to figure out how to use this money that we've been given. Okay. Cause we got, we got some money. And one of the things that I thought about was doing um, an ongoing documentary about all of these stories that are not being told and make sure they don't get buried. Because when, when, they, when they are by the mass media, as you know, the stories can air for a time only when it's convenient and then they get buried. They don't want to hear the stories over and over. But when you're away from that influence and they, this money came to us from private sources. So they don't control this organization. And this organization is apolitical. I have no political agenda or affiliation. I care about human beings. That's who I'm here to serve. So tell me, what can we do? What do you feel like are some of the actionable solutions like that we could immediately start implementing? What does your community need? How can we support you around trauma, mental health? 
that's what the money is for. Also, they also said if, if we, within your communities, you have veterans as well, because they know that veterans also need a lot of mental health services, that, that's where the money is also um, slated for assisting. So let me know. Awesome. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, um, I don't know if like TJ, he, um, he <coughs> spoke about one of our uh, ceremonies, Sundat ceremonies and we have a special time each day to, you know, set those, like I talked about putting that stuff out into the universe and, you know, and it's going to hear us. <coughs> we, um, <coughs> so those special times are um, the first day we, we think about our mourners. And then the next day we, we make some time for our women and children. Okay, so mourners and women and children. By the yeah. way, Paul is here. He's going to be talking about mourning, grief, and loss. Just so you know, he's he, he's next up on the agenda. Okay, so mourners. Mm -hmm. Then our women and children. Women and children. Our um, <clears throat> our uh, elders, and then our uh, veterans. Ah. We, okay, uh, so you have um, veterans. Yes. Okay. Yeah, veterans in the, the service, like you said, struggling with uh, PTSD. And in in um, here at home, if we if we have a we know a veteran is coming home, you know, they'll even meet them and have a good welcoming home. And uh, if if they find out, you know, they're coming home, you know, people will go to the airport and they'll meet them and uh, greet them, give them gifts to make them feel good to, uh, you know, some thanks. And then like the representation of um, us gifting blankets, how that's a protection for them and that's a comfort for them. Um, and then uh, those struggling with the PTSD, I feel like that part kind of kind of gets left behind and uh, needs a lot of focus because, you know, even within our own community and people we love and care about, they, they struggle with that PTSD. And, uh, you know, I'm not any kind of professional, you know, I, I can, I can pray. And, um, but as far as that, uh, you know, uh, kind of almost reconnecting with that trauma and healing it from where it started at, you know, I feel like that's probably important to go back to the beginning and um, within our lives, you know, you, you have these building blocks within your lives that, you know, carries you your foundation onto the next thing, the next thing. And if there's something missing, you know, it kind of, you can fall apart a little bit easier, I guess, so to say. Um, so to, um, uh, recognize those building blocks and to um, build build those if something is lacking something is missing maybe um, to go to that and some tools to to be able to um, to build those even with our women and children you know a lot of our women are uh, choosing to to use drugs and alcohol and um, you know self-medicating, you know, well, well, what's the root? What's the root cause of that? It's not oh, you you have a problem with drinking or alcohol or, or drinking or drugs, but there's something deeper than that. You know, what what's what's below that? What's making you to feel like you want to do those things instead of be present and be there for your children and um, be a good parent? Some people, you know, when they have children, you have a motherly instinct and you know if they didn't in their childhood growing up didn't have that how do you teach that you know how, how, how do you how do you show them that and be able to um, break those cycles and to be healthy and to have healthy kids okay and 
I do all of those things. <laughs> you know, we, we work a child up, right? And we, we rebuild from the foundation. And one of the processes we use is reparenting. And we show them how to do that, reparent themselves, okay? Um, we know what we wanted to hear. We know what we wanted to experience. And we actually do role play and all of that kind of stuff. I have a whole program already developed for that. Already done. I don't even have to invent it. It's done. Um, let's continue that conversation. It's we are now at time for 30 is Dr. Kapal's time. And I know that he is a busy man. Um, and I, I love say something real quick. Laura? Yeah, yes, yes. I love real quick. it. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I know you I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, so what you know what she was saying is that like at our Sundance, we have that uh like the first day, you know, like she was saying, mourners, second day, women and children, third day, we do something for elders, the fourth day, we do something for our veterans. Yes. Um, we're actually planning on, on making a veterans camp um, this coming year. Yes. Um, so we're supposed to have our veterans from around the area here. And then some veterans are coming from um, California um, to come and camp and to, to be at the Sundance to get some healing. Yes. So just as what you were asking, you know, that's one way that, you know, we could use support. We also have our own nonprofit that we, um, we incorporated in uh, 2017. Okay. It's called uh, Medicine Butte CDC. If you need more information, I could uh, you could just inbox me. Yeah. But yeah, we're incorporated. You know, we're all good with you know um, current and all that stuff. You know, with the state, IRS, all that. And um, so one of our um, one of our objectives for community healing is uh, culture and language. And then another objective is housing. And then another objective is. Um, um, food sovereignty and then another objective is uh domestic violence okay and, and, the, and, and the way we see it is like culture and language is like a stock of corn and then these other ones are leaves that are coming off of it these other objectives and that's what we want to address things in our community and those are kind of the main ones and then veterans you know want to address that too to help them but through all of those you know through that culture and language it'll take it, there's there's a part of it that takes care of all of those ob objectives and then we also have like i said um it's called shell creek native american church we uh incorporated that church and um july 13th of uh this year so i'm the i'm the spokesman spokesperson for that church and we took out you know churches always have a board we took the board out and we made it a traditional council so nobody is higher or lower than anybody. So it's just, we have a meeting and we make an agenda and then we give everyone a chance to, to, to say what they need to. We'll put it on the agenda, but then they can speak. And then we, uh, so we're, that's a new church. So we're trying to develop a church grounds uh, area, um, a teepee grounds area will be on that same place, some sweat lodges, and then a building for, um, uh, like for people to eat, cook, you know, when they're having the ceremony. Oh, some bathrooms, fellowship, you know, um, so then that everyone will be comfortable, nice little parking area, you know, so those are some things that's on our minds, that's what we're working towards, we're actually going to a conference, or we're, we're, we're going to go to Las Vegas the first week of November, uh, we're doing just a one evening deal um, with some other nonprofits down there, so if you're interested, let me know, and we're going to try to set it up on Zoom, and then um, we're going to be presenting like some more about the culture and stuff. And like Lori's going to be presenting about and a few other ladies, then myself and a few gentlemen. And then we have uh, another relative too that he's going to be presenting about like two spirited stuff okay. to keep things uh, like balanced, you know, between everybody. So it's just not one sided, one 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 viewpoint. Yes. You know, so so just to try to answer your question, like how could you help? Well, that's what we're doing. Uh, that's okay. what we're trying to do. So just to keep all those things in mind. Okay. So, uh, and I know it's all over the place, you know, everyone's doing the same, you know, everywhere, you know, so. Well, I, I go where I'm invited. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where we invited to help. And so I want to help with all and any of those things. So get me the dates for the, you said first week in November. And yeah. then if, if I need to be there in person, let me know so I can arrange flights and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I'm in. 
Just okay, count. yeah, I know it's it's short. I could send you. Uh, we actually had a board meeting last night, talked about it. So, okay. well, um, I could send you the agenda that we have. It's we kind of got it written up, so okay. I could just email that to you. Yeah. And then that's that's the Vegas trip, and then uh, send you like the meeting minutes from last night too. Okay, and I and I have family in Vegas, so oh, let's, okay, let's make that happen. Okay. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I know you um, have enjoyed this conversation, as have I. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Tom, if you or your wife, Lori, would like to respond to any of the questions within the okay. chat, I do want to make sure that I presence that Dr. Kapal has arrived. Yeah. And he yeah. is on the program to deliver the closing address in terms of how we can mitigate grief and loss, particularly post-trauma, okay? So if you'd like to stay on for that, it's going to be incredible. Um, Dr. Kapal, just know that I'm going to stop and restart both the live and the Zoom just so that we can close this out and start another program because people are asking for all of the segments who weren't able to be here. So that's what we're gonna do. So just give us um, just about two minutes to just stop and restart and we'll spot Dr. Kapal up next, okay? Thank you so much again, Lori and Tom Plenty Chief for being here. We are gonna continue this relationship Okay, you have my word that we will figure out how we can work together to help you as much as I possibly can. Okay? Okay. Thank you. All so right, much. thank you.